Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Before we get back to Queen Alisane and her adventures in the North, we have a few quick announcements to make. With the help of our patrons and a few other longtime followers, we've successfully remodeled our Patreon page and created tiers, ranging in price from $2 to $20, with benefits including PDF versions of our scripts, voting rights on future videos, audio-only versions of our videos, which, with regard to future videos, will likely be available up to 24 hours prior to our actual videos being uploaded to YouTube, and patron-exclusive podcasts. So, if you'd like to support our channel and become a member of our Patreon community, the link is in the description below. For those of you who aren't interested in making monthly donations or being flooded with even more Song of Ice and Fire content, but still find us totally awesome and want to contribute to and or support our channel, it was suggested by one of our followers that we create an Order of the Green Hand PayPal account, which also has a link in the description below. And lastly, due to the fact that we received several requests for this during our little Patreon remodel and thought it was actually a really cool idea, but felt like it didn't belong on Patreon because it's only a one-time benefit. For a very limited time only, a $100 PayPal donation gives you the opportunity to literally choose a video that you want us to make. This video will be dedicated to you, and along with this dedication, we're going to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one Google Hangout with you to discuss the topic that you chose, giving you a behind-the-scenes look at the process we use to make videos. But, enough of this business talk. It's time to turn our attention back to Alisane and my main man, Alaric Stark. So, let's do this. Alaric had lost his wife three years earlier. When the Queen expressed regret that she had never had the pleasure of meeting Lady Stark, the Northman said, She was a Mormont of Bear Isle, and no lady by your lights, but she took an axe to a pack of wolves when she was twelve, killed two of them, and sewed a cloak from their skins. She gave me two strong sons as well and a daughter as sweet to look upon as any of your southern ladies. When her grace suggested that she would be pleased to help arrange marriages for his sons to the daughters of great southern lords, Lord Stark refused brusquely. We keep the old gods in the north, he told the queen. When my boys take a wife, they will wed before a heart tree, not in some southern sept. Alisane Targaryen did not yield easily, however. The lords of the South honored the old gods as well as the new, she told Lord Alaric. Most every castle that she knew had a godswood as well as a sept. And there were still certain houses that had never accepted the seven, no more than the Northmen had. The Blackwoods and the Riverlands chief amongst them, and mayhaps as many as a dozen more. Even a lord as stern and flinty as Alaric Stark found himself helpless before Queen Alisane's stubborn charm. He allowed that he would think on what she said, and raise the matter with his sons. Okay, so here we find Alisane working her magic. First, by bringing up Alaric's late wife, immediately prompting him to talk about his children which likely is exactly what she wanted him to do, as it provided her with an opportunity to suggest arranging realm-binding marriages between his sons and daughter and children of powerful southern lords, a dozen of which apparently worship the old gods, which I have to admit is a fascinating little piece of information. Now, before we try to figure out who these dozen other houses are, we wanted to point out that the Targaryens are continuing the Valyrian practice of religious tolerance. This stands in stark contrast to the Faith of the Seven, who are obviously extremely intolerant to other religions 
and happened to have ruled Westeros with an iron fist prior to Aegon's arrival. Even with three huge dragons and an army, Aegon didn't want to incur the wrath of the Faith, and always made sure to give them their due respect foreseeing the potential for them to be his biggest rival. Because of the incredible influence the Faith had with regard to the hearts and minds of most of the people that he ruled. This power was not to be underestimated, and about ten seconds after he died, it was used. And if not for the grit and determination of Magor, Jaehaerys, Alysanne, and every other Targaryen would likely be dead. It also seems noteworthy to point out that Alaric said his sons and daughter would marry in front of a heart tree, not a weirwood, which once again underscores the difference between the old gods of the first men and the weirwoods the children of the forest worship as gods. The pact forced the first men to worship at or in front of weirwoods, but that's not the same thing as worshipping weirwoods. But let's get back to the fact that Alysanne pointed out that as many as a dozen families besides the Blackwoods still worship the old gods, south of the Neck. Which, to be honest, was akin to a bomb going off in my head. So, who are these dozen other families? Well, there's very little to go on, but since we're on the topic and we spent entirely too much time trying to figure it out, we decided to hazard a few guesses and hopefully Fire and Blood or future books will let us know if we're correct. These guesses include the Greenfields, Royces, Ironwoods, Bulwers, Masseys, Dairies, Strongs, Cranes, Dundarians, Darklands, Smallwoods, and Plums. So there it is. We went on the record. Hopefully one day we'll find out if we're right. The longer the Queen stayed, the more Lord Alaric warmed to her. And in time... Alysanne came to realize that not everything that was said of him was true. He was careful with his coin, but not niggardly. He was not humorless at all, though his humor had an edge to it, sharp as a knife. His sons and daughter and the people of Winterfell seemed to love him well enough. Once the initial frost had thawed, his lordship took the queen hunting after elk and wild boar in the wolf's wood showed her the bones of a giant, and allowed her to rummage as she pleased through his modest castle library. He even deigned to approach Silverwing, though warily. The women of Winterfell were taken by the queen's charms as well, once they grew to know her. Her grace became particularly close with Lord Alaric's daughter, Alara. When the rest of the queen's party finally turned up at the castle gates, after struggling through trackless bogs and summer snows, the meat and mead flowed freely, despite the king's absence. Things were not going as well at King's Landing, meanwhile. The peace talks dragged on far longer than anticipated, for the acrimony between the two free cities ran deeper than Jahari's had known. When His Grace attempted to strike a balance, both sides accused him of favoring the other. Whilst the prince and the archon dickered, fights began to break out between their men across the city, in inns, brothels, and wine sinks. A Pentoshi guardsman was set upon and killed, and three nights later, the archon's own galley was set afire where she was docked. The king's departure was delayed, and delayed again. Okay, so this is very interesting, because these two leaders supposedly wanted to make peace, yet when they got to King's Landing, their behavior seems to indicate otherwise. This brings us back to our initial suspicions, and how they decided to act on their desire to make peace at the exact moment Jaehaerys was supposed to leave for an extremely important royal progress to the north. And now that they are here, supposedly to make peace, they don't seem to have much interest in doing anything other than fighting one another and attempting to cast Jaehaerys as taking one side or another. All of this made me wonder what these two seemingly unrelated free cities were fighting about to begin with. They appear to be about 800 or 900 miles away from each other, 
and share no borders. The only thing I can think of that would bring these two cities into conflict with one another would be if Pentoshi trading galleys were being overtaxed or pirated by the Tairoshi as they made their way through the Stepstones, which eventually led to Pentoshi retaliation and a war. Given that both sides claim to be ready for peace, why it's taking what appears to have been months to be in no way closer to the peace they claim to want seems a bit suspicious. In fact, Jaehaerys offering his help has accomplished nothing but turning King's Landing into a war zone, and the fact that the Archon of Tyrosh's own personal ship just got burned, it seems increasingly unlikely that a peace accord will be struck anytime soon. The gods in the free cities had other plans indeed. The thing that actually confuses me the most about this is the fact that striking a peace in what appears to be a trade war would really only require the Tairoshi naming their price or their tax that they intend to charge Pentoshi merchant ships to pass through their territory. Tairosh, for those of you who aren't familiar, was originally set up for this express purpose. Its position in the Stepstones gave Valyria control over what passed through the Stepstones, which is the only way to get goods from eastern Westeros and western Essos to ports like Old Town, Lannisport, Volantis, and those in the Far East. In these negotiations with Pentos, it's likely that Pentos would say no to whatever their first offer was, and there would need to be a little back-and-forth haggling. But if peace was really what they wanted, they'd settle somewhere in the middle. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like that should take, I don't know, a day or two? A week or two at most? Which also appears to have been what Jaehaerys and his advisors thought. Otherwise, it seems unlikely that Jaehaerys would have wanted Alsane to go north when she did, and place her in the position of having to spend months up there by herself, with a very powerful lord that might feel slighted that the king didn't show up himself. So... What were Pentos and Tyrosh playing at? First of all, why is the Prince of Pentos even the one that's here negotiating on behalf of Pentos? It's a ceremonial title that holds no real power. The Magisters rule Pentos, and everyone knows this. So, did the Prince even have the authority to negotiate this ceasefire? Or was he just considered expendable? and was sent there as a provocation to the Archon, who would know that he's negotiating with an empty title. Or was this whole thing just a charade? That would kind of make sense when you consider what happened when they got there. Imagine if, in feudal Europe, the Dutch and the French were fighting a three-year trade war that essentially turned the English Channel into a war zone. It would be devastating to English port cities all along their eastern coastline. So, the King of England offered to broker a peace between them. And after some time passed, when the time came for his pre-planned trip to York to give his northernmost lords their due attention, the French and Dutch showed up and said they wanted to accept his offer. Given how crippling the trade war would have been to his port cities, the King of England would be forced to prioritize their visit even if it meant risking injury to his relationship with his northernmost lords. Then, when the French and Dutch arrived in London, his court and capital turned into a war zone. Would the King of England tolerate this, or would he begin questioning whether the French and Dutch were actually working together to destabilize his kingdom, and had been using their alleged trade war to pirate English trade ships for the past three years? If I were him and the chaos their war caused had essentially given them license to plunder English traders with impunity while being able to blame each other for it every time it happened, costing my kingdom untold fortunes in lost cargo and diminished trade, only to have them show up just in time to threaten my relationship with one of my most powerful lords, I'd be looking at them as enemies, not friends. In the north, Queen Alisane grew restless with waiting and decided to take her leave of Winterfell for a time, and visit the men of the Night's Watch at Castle Black. The distance was not negligible, even flying. 
Her grace landed at the last hearth and several smaller keeps and holdfasts on her way, to the surprise and delight of their lords, whilst a portion of her tail scrambled after her. The rest remained at Winterfell. Her first sight of the wall from above took Alysanne's breath away, her grace would later tell the king. There had been some concern how the queen might be received at Castle Black, for many of the Black brothers had been poor fellows and warriors' sons before those orders were abolished. But Lord Stark sent ravens ahead to warn of her coming, and the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Lothor Burley, assembled eight hundred of his finest men to receive her. That night, the Black Brothers feasted the Queen on mammoth meat, washed down with mead and stout. As dawn broke the next day, Lord Burley took her grace to the top of the wall. Here the world ends, he told her, gesturing at the vast green expanse of the haunted forest beyond. Burley was apologetic for the quality of the food and drink presented to the Queen, and the rudeness of the accommodations at Castle Black. We do what we can, Your Grace, the Lord Commander explained, but our beds are hard, and our halls are cold, and our food is nourishing, the Queen finished, and that is all that I require. It will please me to eat as you do. The men of the Night's Watch were as thunderstruck by the Queen's dragon as the people of White Harbor had been, though the Queen herself noted that Silverwing does not like this wall. Though it was summer and the wall was weeping, the chill of the ice could still be felt whenever the wind blew, and every gust would make the dragon hiss and snap. Thrice I flew Silverwing high above Castle Black, and thrice I tried to take her north beyond the wall, Alisane wrote to Jaharis. But every time she veered back south again and refused to go. Never before has she refused to take me where I wish to go. I laughed about it when I came down again, so the Black Brothers would not realize anything was amiss. But it troubled me then, and it troubles me still. Okay, so George indicated in a recent blog post that Fire and Blood contains evidence of historical revisionism, which essentially tells you what most of you who have seen our Lying Piece of Shit Andal series already know. The Grey Rats who keep the histories are liars, who spin the truth to suit their own agenda. In the histories told by the Grey Rats, it is claimed that Alsane grew bored and then took her leave of Winterfell to go to the Wall. But here it says, she grew restless with waiting, which is entirely different than someone just being bored. Being restless with waiting implies impatience with how long it's taking Jaehaerys to come north, while the way the Grey Rats recorded it as bored implies that Winterfell lacks anything of interest to her. It is a subtle difference, I know, but when you read the Grey Rats history books, these subtle differences begin adding up, and paint a very different picture of what really happened. Anyways, Alysanne had essentially accomplished everything the Royal Progress was designed to do, and that the purpose of this trip was to improve relations with the North, and in spite of the King's absence, the Starks of Winterfell were now counted amongst their friends. At this point, she decided that she'd like to see the Wall. That's about an 800-mile flight, which, to give you guys a little perspective, is like flying from Georgia to New York City, which, even on Dragonback, is not exactly a day trip. She made a few stops along the way, much to the delight of everyone she met, and eventually made it to Castle Black. Alaric Stark, who had obviously grown fond of her at this point, seemed to fear for her safety, with all the former poor fellows and warrior sons, who had been forced to take the black in recent years, and sent word ahead to Lord Commander Burley, who assembled an astonishing 800 Night's Watchmen to greet her. Alysanne, who had already proved herself to be quite a lady in her hunting trips with Lord Alaric, once again showed that she is no ordinary queen, choosing to eat whatever the Night's Watchmen ate, and requiring no special treatment. 
This once again underscores the type of conquest Aegon intended. His heirs, in carrying on his tradition of royal progresses, travel about the realm learning about those they govern, and require almost nothing in return but the king's peace. And now, the most mind-blowing part of this little excerpt, the grand finale. After first noting that Silverwing clearly hated the wall, she climbed aboard, intent on flying over it to see what lies beyond, and learned it was not possible. Or, sort of. She, in our opinion, mistook Silverwing's lack of ability to fly over the wall as Silverwing refusing to do what she wanted. But when combined with the fact that Silverwing hissed and snapped at the wall every time a cold wind blew off it, it seems clear that the reason Silverwing hated something about the wall was the magic within it that prevented her from passing. Silverwing was a beast that, up until that moment, knew no constraints but those Alisane placed on her. And when faced with an impassable magical force that limited her movement, she became angry and agitated. I just hope those two guys who make the show didn't read this. The shade it throws at their asininely stupid episode beyond the wall might be too much for them to handle.